Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she would hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendees were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nest the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She, be, she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Good morning, everybody. And uh, so this passage that we've just had read to us, it's got to, to my mind, had a sort of fairy tale like quality to it. Um, we know some of the background is that uh, there's a wicked ruler in the kingdom. And we have, for what a better way of putting it, this uh, humble family where they've given birth to a boy and have. Uh, initially hidden it from view and then put it in a basket and hidden it in the River Nile where the uh, daughter of the uh, ruler of the kingdom has found it um, and then the, miraculously the baby gets returned to its own mother who is then paid to look after him and bring him up. Um, I also thought that this idea of putting your baby in a basket and sticking him in the river was very much an issue of safeguarding and a uh, uh, certainly an idea for social services intervention if that happened in those days. Um, but I'm hoping we can draw out a number of lessons uh, from this passage. I think there were a couple of questions um, that need answering. Um, there are a couple of theological lessons which I think came out of this, Some, one of which I felt was a little bit academic. Um, one was possibly more of a tenuous analogy. Uh, and then we'll have a look at the actions and behaviours of the principal characters in this passage, see what we can be uh, learning from that, challenged by or encouraged by. And uh, lastly, um, something to look forward to, uh, I'll finish off with possibly one of the worst jokes you'll ever hear uh, in a sermon. And those of you who have heard me speak before may think, well, there's a lot of competition for that. Uh, so, Firstly, two questions that arise uh, if we just take this passage and read it without knowing much else of what's going on. Why was Moses hidden? This would be a strange thing for you to do to your child um, if there was not a good reason to do so. Uh, and that just highlights um, the, the fact that when we're reading a passage of scripture, we get better understanding if we know the scriptures that have come before it. So the earlier part of the chapter tells us why uh, Moses' uh, mother was hiding him, because Pharaoh had sent out a decree that all the um, male children born to the Hebrew mothers should be cast into the Nile um, and drowned and put to death. So this uh, was Moses' mother uh, not wanting to have to do that to her child and hiding him away uh, from the Egyptians uh, or any Hebrews that might um, tell on her and have Moses discovered as a male child who need to be disposed of. So that first question is, what's going on with this hiding the baby is only really fully understandable by knowing scriptures that surround and come before this particular passage. And that is much, uh, if you like, uh, a warning to us when we do read scripture passages uh, or verses um, that we should understand what's going on by putting them into the context of what else is going on, what else has been said that re relevant to the topic and not just read that passage in isolation and expect to have a full understanding of what's going on. But there's a second question which uh, is not answered and is possibly unanswerable and is actually quite troubling. 
because it says that Moses' mother looked at him and because he was a fine or goodly child, she hid him away. And some translations uh, offer either special child or beautiful child. But the implication of that is that if he wasn't a fine child, if he wasn't a goodly child, if he was somehow ugly or bad, that she wouldn't have bothered with him. And that's a, a rather frightening thought. That's not actually answerable um, in the text. It's not answerable elsewhere. We don't know why it was particularly the case that he was told to be, that we were told that he was fine or goodly as the reasons for hiding him. And again, that highlights the fact that sometimes we can read passages, we can read scripture, and there can be bits of it that we don't understand and have, ans uh, have questions about. And sometimes those questions just can't be answered. And really that should lead us to uh, realize that our understanding is not as good as God's understanding and never can be. There are some things that maybe it's better for us not to know because having a full knowledge uh, would make it unbearable for us or maybe just not understandable. It says um, at the end of the passage that Moses were called Moses because it means I drew him out of the water. Uh, and it's interesting because one commentary says that actually it's an Egyptian name and it means son or child, but it sounds like the Hebrew word for I drew him out of the water. And it, it's here that we get a sort of, if you like, a more of a theological picture, um, a picture of baptism, if you like, where uh, Moses was born at a time when he was under an edict that he should die straight away. Just as when we are born due to original sin, we are destined to destruction or, or, or to perish because of the curse of Adam upon us. Moses' mother sent him and hit him in the water where he was found and he was brought out of the water and he was rescued by in this case, the daughter of the supreme ruler of the time. And that's a picture of us coming out of the waters of baptism. Uh, I'm not sure if this has any sort of practical applications for us, um, but it just acts as a, a picture of us dying to our old self and the new life that we get as we come up out of the waters of baptism. Uh, there's also, uh, as I said, um, more of a tenuous an analogy because it talks, we talk these days about Moses baskets and probably many of you uh, as parents uh, have uh, Moses baskets. Many of your children might have been put in a Moses basket. But the Moses baskets we have today, um, and certainly the one we had as parents, was not made with reeds and tar. It was not waterproof. And I think if anybody had um, suggested we put that basket with our children in, in the river, uh, we would have been horrified at the thought of that actually just sinking. But Moses basket these days, um, they have a practical use in holding a baby, say somewhere warm and comfortable for them to sleep, often have nice fine linens, are decorated with fancy patterns. Um, whereas the original Moses basket was uh, a very practical, pragmatic, this is not going to sink, this is going to keep you safe. And the, the sort of vague link is that sometimes we take what's in scripture and we add to it and we make it more flowery and we make it more than it really is um that there could be another sermon in there uh, separate to this one um about what we do with baptism for example um what we do with communion uh, is, is another thing what we do uh, in some denominations uh, with our with our ministers and getting them to dress up uh, in things that maybe the original um, leaders in the church did not do. So those are the two questions, the two theological, um, and ten tenuous theological points. I think now we're going to look at the characters involved in this uh, in this story. So interestingly, apart from Moses, none of the other three are named at this time. In actual fact, uh, Pharaoh's daughter is never named. Later on, we know that Moses' mother uh, is called Jochebed, and Moses' sister is Miriam, and of course Moses himself. And if we look at the actions of Moses' mother to start with, 
so she gave birth to a child and he was a male and the law at the time said she should declare this and then the law would have Moses put to death but she went against this civil law because quite rightly there is a bigger law God's law about not killing um, about love and mercy and nurture and she went against the civil law and uh, for the law of God and for the sake of love when the time came when she felt she could no longer hide him uh, she sent him to the uh, Nile in his uh, in his basket and uh, hoping or expecting maybe even that someone would find him there and hopefully keep him safe and indeed that's what happened the pharaoh's daughter came along and she found him and although recognizing him as uh, a hebrew child and knowing um, what the law was she did not consider that she should actually put him to death but she kept uh, this quiet and uh, as we see in a minute arranged for him to be looked after uh, by his own mother although she herself did not know that Moses was going back to his own mother. Um, but that comes about because Moses' sister Miriam is standing there at a distance watching what's going on uh, and ready to intercede uh, and to intervene when the time came and uh, persuaded Pharaoh's daughter to let Moses go to a Hebrew woman and she said she would find an appropriate Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. Uh, and as we know full well, that was actually um, Moses' own mother. And then later on, when he is of age to uh, be weaned, Moses' mother, Miriam, uh, sorry, uh, Jochebed, actually honours uh, the promise, if you like, of, uh, uh, and the contract with Pharaoh's daughter and sends Moses back to be with Pharaoh's daughter and to be brought up in the palace and not in her own home with her. And she does not see him grow up uh, to be a teenager, an adolescent, a young man, and into manhood for herself. That happens somewhere else. And of course, then there's Moses himself, who is there, helpless in the basket, a victim of circumstances, uh, subject to the law, but actually in the end, subject to grace. So, Moses' mother, she had the example of defying the civil law and of doing something that was more important in God's eyes. And uh, as we maybe think of uh, events over the past week, uh, yesterday in particular, uh, whether you come down on one side or the other, whether you think it's good or, or good or bad, what has happened, certainly there are people who feel that uh, there are some civil laws that should be disobeyed for a greater good. Uh, and obviously we as Christians should make sure that if we're doing that, it is for the, uh, the good of uh, Christ and for the good of God's law, not just because we think uh, we are better or have a better idea than other people. We have Miriam, Moses' sister, ready to step in and to speak on behalf of Moses, who could obviously not speak for himself. Uh, maybe we uh, at work or in the streets or in the shops or in our own families uh, and wider circle of friends um, see situations where actually what we need to do is to step in uh, and to give a voice uh, either to people who have no voice for themselves or who maybe can't articulate for themselves their own feelings, their own thoughts and their own needs. There was Pharaoh's daughter who uh, to begin with, obviously felt that she couldn't actually fulfil the need of Moses um, uh, as a mother, but obviously later on actually took him into the palace. And it wasn't uh, just a hashtag um, standing with the Hebrew women. Um, it wasn't love and prayers out to Moses' mother. It was actual action uh, backed up by finance, uh, backed up by actually taking him into her own home. And it may well be that uh, what we need to do is to provide finance um, or to sponsor children who had no, uh, no learning, no homes, uh, to provide money because we are uh, blessed in that way. Um, maybe even if possible, or if it's right, take people into our homes uh, where we can provide for them in a way that they 
that they need. And then, of course, there's Moses himself. And it may be this morning that you're feeling more like a Moses. You're feeling a victim of your circumstances. It may feel be that you're feeling abandoned. Um, it may be feeling you're feeling useless. And yet we can see that even for Moses in his helpless state, there were other people who were looking out for him, even though he didn't and couldn't even know it. And maybe that's uh, something that some of us maybe need to take away. There are other people out there that maybe we don't know are doing it, are praying for us, uh, out there acting on our behalf, and we just don't see the effect of that yet. Moses himself, um, and if you'll forgive me for this, was the original basket case. <laughs> You may think of yourself or look at someone else and think that person is a real basket case. They are useless. You may feel yourself that you are useless. But we know that uh, later on, Moses uh, became a great leader of men, uh, men and women. He led his people out of slavery, out of um, oppression and eventually into the promised land. Um, and indeed has become one of the uh, most revered uh, and well-known people as a prophet, not just in Christianity and Judaism, but also in Islam, um, from a very inauspicious beginning floating along in the River Nile in the reeds. So whichever one of these people you feel you can identify with this morning, um, there may be challenges for things that we need to do either for ourselves or more importantly, on behalf of other people, but also to remind ourselves that whatever situation we're in, however we're feeling, that there is God, the supreme ruler, does not want us to die, but wants us to live. Jesus, who is the son of the king, is standing there in heaven, interceding on our behalf, just as Miriam interceded on Moses' behalf in the basket. So be encouraged. Remember when you're reading scripture, not to be too isolated and narrow down your focus too much, but to remember wider scriptures. Remember that there are other people out there, even if you don't know it, who are praying and supporting and interceding for you. And examine yourself to see where you can step in to help others or provide the needs for others. And as we do this, we will find that God blesses us more and we bless other people. Thank you very much for listening. Amen.